Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to stand up here. Welcome everyone. Uh, if you haven't met me already, my name is Matt Dyson. I have the honour to chair this session of the size. One of the organisers, other organisers is here as well, Paul Jarvis, Karen in that corner. Um, if there's anything we can do, let us know during the course of things. There's also, obviously, some really talented staff from Bindman's and we're very, very grateful that they've hosted us. This is our second on location size, the first of which was at the Criminal Cases Review Commission in Burma a couple of years ago. Otherwise, we've rotated between the founding institutions of Oxford, Cambridge and UCL. And we've gone on, this, uh, on location, so to speak, this time, partly to make sure that we're reaching all the constituencies that we like to come in, all the, that we want to be uh, connected to. In particular, in this instance, we're managing to highlight the role of defence solicitors, in particular one firm supporting this event, Bindman's. But um, the whole point is we want to be connected to where the criminal law is happening. That's why we're bridging academic, practitioner, judicial, law reformer, and even student roles in the, in the development of the criminal law. So from our perspective, we're really delighted to, to be here. We're particularly grateful to Katie and her team for making that possible. But we have an amazing lineup for the three sessions today. We're starting about 10 to 15 minutes late, so we'll be catching that up as the day goes on. But I won't say any more uh, for the moment, other than to introduce our first speakers. So public interest in criminal proceedings, for which you should have a handout. Good. Uh, and our first speaker is Katie Wheatley of Feynman's, and the comment is going to be uh, by Her Honour Judge Angela Rafferty. So uh, over to you, Katie. Uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And first of all, um, of course, it's it's a wonderful event, this, this seminar programme, and so we're very pleased to be hosting it. Uh, and of course, thank you as well, uh, uh, Your Honour, for commenting on <laughs> this paper. Uh, and of course, we can't do this without a whole audience and everyone commenting. And so it's fantastic to see so many people here today. So um, I chose this topic thinking uh, uh, maybe there were a few things that I could look at. What does public interest in criminal proceedings mean to me in the context of this talk? And I've sort of landed on three things. The first of which is the uh, role of the CPS uh, and the application of the full code test uh, and its interaction with um, private prosecutions. Uh, the second is um, uh, more theoretical, a public interest in creating new offences of failing in a duty to do something uh, and comparing those types of offences with an instance where regulation has been closed and over criminalisation and asking whether we've learnt the right lessons in the last 20 years. Uh, and thirdly, I've looked a little bit at whistleblowing um, and public interest defence uh, to the Official Secrets Act, which um, the Law Commission recommended um, uh, but which the government is uh, certainly not very keen on and hasn't taken forward, uh, and how and a little bit of linkage with the National Security Bill, which includes other provisions that were recommended by the Commission. So, so first of all, looking at the um, the, the public interest uh, uh, tests that CPS apply, uh, and knowing, of course, that there are CPS practitioners in the room, uh, hoping I won't go step on tread on their toes or say anything controversial about their role, but. Um, we all know as practitioners certainly that there is the full code test that prosecutors will always apply this being state prosecutors uh, and that's that uh, they have to decide whether there's sufficient evidence for a realistic prospect of conviction um, and secondly if if uh, if so a, uh, a prosecution would normally follow unless there are public factors that uh, public interest factors that militate against that um, and we will be familiar with the, um, the range of circumstances that get taken into account such as the seriousness of the offence, culpability, the circumstances of the victim, harm caused, age and maturity, community impact, proportionality and perhaps even also issues relating to public interest immunity. <clears throat> So um, the, the, the sort of the, the independence of the CPS and other prosecutors such as the SFO, I would say is, is, is really fundamentally important because none of these organizations have a specific interest in the outcome of any particular case. They're not victims. And this independence can be of particular value when it comes to a dispassionate assessment of the evidence and operation of the discretion uh, whether to prosecute. And of course, vast experience also plays into the, that decision making as well. And what what, what the experience of what's done well in front of juries and what hasn't is also enormously important. And those decisions will be underpinned by policy and can be challenged, of course, by judicial review. But in recent years, there's been a growing appetite for private prosecutions, 
uh, by people who assert that they're victims of crime. Um, some have been held to have improper motives, such as undermining or discrediting a person to serve a wider commercial objective. And others have um, floundered being politically motivated, such as the attempt to prosecute Boris Johnson for uh, the numbers on the side of the red bus in the Brexit referendum. Um, but we will all know the scandal of the miscarriages of justice um, that resulted from all of those post office prosecutions. Uh, and so it is quite clear that the consequences of misuse of the right to bring a private prosecution can be disastrous. And this led to the House of Comm Commons Justice Committee producing a report. Um, uh, and we're, of course, all, also waiting an outcome of the public inquiry. So um, private prosecutors aren't bound by the CPS code, but there is a private prosecutors association that has its own code, which states that it's considered to be best practice for a private prosecutor to apply a full code test. But uh, the association doesn't perform any regulatory function and not all private prosecutors, of course, will be members. Um, uh, but private prosecutions have been seen as a, uh, as a, as a stepping stone for uh, or, or or, or stepping into the void that's been left by the state, particularly in the area of fraud, which we all know has, um, hasn't resulted in, uh, in, in much activity on the part of the police uh, for, for very complex reasons. But, um, uh, uh, and those, and those who, who conduct pros private prosecutions would say that the safeguards for defendants um, are sufficient because they include the CPS's power to review and take over um, uh, and the court also, of course, has jurisdiction over abuse of process and disclosure and such like. But um, we also know that post office uh, defendants were supposed to benefit from all of those um, uh, supposed safeguards and none of, the, none of those who were wrongly convicted did. So the question is really how independent can a private prosecutor be um, when it comes to decisions to stop proceedings in the public interest or make decisions about disclosure? And those concerns about potential lack of independence are only added to by the shocking imbalance of resources that can arise as between the defendant and the uh, private prosecutor um, and the ability to recover costs. So, uh, for example, the private uh, prosecutor can recover all of their costs at, at, uh, what are, you know, at commercial rates and are privately paying um, accused, if, if, if they indeed have any means to pay. Um, can only recover at legal aid rates, um, and the government, uh, the government, in response to the Justice Committee's re report, agreed that the present arrangements for funding pros private prosecutions are inequitable, as between prosecutors and defendants, and do not always represent a cost-effective use of public money, and that private prosecu prosecutors' recoverable costs should be capped at legal aid rates. However, I'm, I haven't noticed that any legislation has yet been enacted to that effect. Although someone in this room might correct me. Um, so on to the CPS review, um, it stands next to the right to bring private prosecution, which is pres expressly preserved by um, Section 6.1 of the Prosecution Offence of Offences Act. However, Section 6.2 empowers the CPS to review and, if necessary, take over a private prosecution and, if appropriate, either continue or drop it. CPS guidance indicates that a case will be taken over to stop it where the full code test is not met. And it also lists some factors peculiar to private prosecutions um, or which would be damaging to the interests of justice, which might be considered such as whether um, uh, the, the prosecution would interfere with an, another offence or investigation or prosecution of another offence or charge or is vex vexatious or malicious or a breach of some kind of promise of immunity or where caution has already been given. Um, and I've seen that the power to take over and drop isn't infrequently used. So statistics were, uh, were referred to in the, uh, by the House of Commons Justice Committee reveal that between April 2019 and March 2020, for example, uh, the CPS received 49 referrals to review private prosecutions, of which they decided to take over 32 of them. And of those 32, 29 were taken over and discontinued and only three were continued. Um, th there's also quite a famous example of the CPS application of the public interest test in the Oleg Derispaska case, um, where the administrative court upheld the CPS's decision to take over and drop his prosecution against an opponent in civil proceedings for perverting the course of justice, um, the CPS taking account of failings and uh, findings in the civil proceedings about the honesty of both principal actors and the negligible harm caused to Doris Pascoe, 
and to the expense of the public purse. And um, the court refused to interfere with that, that, those, uh, that decision, approved, approved it, and also, notified, uh, also noted with some disapproval that the case had the hallmarks of a party in civil proceedings trying to continue the battle in the criminal courts. So in, in addition to the CPS power to review, um, there is also some protection built into the application process, albeit that it's an ex parte process uh, and that common law has developed um, to strengthen uh, um, uh, protections for a prospective defendant at that stage. Um, so there's the, 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 the case of Klan um, indicates that the magistrate should issue a summons where there are five basic factors present. Um, usually this hurdle isn't too difficult to get over. And that's whether the allegation is an offence known to law, whether the essential ingredients of the offence are made prima facie at present, um, whether the alleged offence is or, or isn't out of time, and that the court has jurisdiction, and also whether the informant has the necessary authority to prosecute. Um, but in addition to those five factors, the magistrate must also consider whether the alle allegation is vexatious and the whole of the relevant circumstances. Um, and um, the magistrate is also empowered, empowered to request um, that the prosecutor attend to clarify details, uh, although this, um, again, doesn't have to be on notice to the defence and the defence don't have any right to be heard. Um, there's a case called K, which um, went on to examine a, a bit more carefully what the circumstances might be that would go beyond those five basic tests that um, would have to be considered. And this was a case where a private prosecutor failed to disclose uh, information about a prior settlement agreement that was relevant. Um, and the court held that uh, private advocates acting in private prosecutions have to... Uh, observe the higher standards of probity and integrity, acting as ministers of justice in prefer preference to the interests of their clients. And they, that there's also a duty of candor to make full and frank disclosure. And that there is also a duty to do, disclose material that's relevant to whether an application is vexatious, uh, including the presence of an improper motive or abusive process. And, and to K have been added or bolted on some criminal procedure rules that effectively reinforce um, the, 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 the common law. Um, these include that, uh, and these, these rules apply only to private prosecutors. Uh, so there are some rules that apply to all prosecutors, but so noting the need to strengthen safeguards, um, there are certain disclosure requirements now that are required that, that, that a private prosecutor must follow. And they also have to make a statement effectively saying that everything that they put before the court is true and that they've disclosed everything that they, they ought to be disclosed. And uh, also the criminal procedure rules um, include now a list of things that might be considered by the court um, relevant uh, to declining to issue a summons. And therefore, of course, private prosecutor is on notice that they must mention any of those factors. Um, and those are things like uh, that the court has previously determined a the similar application, or there's been a failure of disclosure of material information, or there's a binding agreement with the defendant not to prosecute, or there's been a representation that there won't be prosecution and the defendant has acted to their de detriment, um, or that the, the, it, what is proposed amounts to challenging the decision of another court. Um, or uh, the dominant motive of the prosecutor would be an abuse of process of the court. Um, and then there's some, also some other cases uh, that have emerged in 2020, 2020 2021. Uh, so in Smith-Allison, uh, the court reiterated that there have to be compelling reasons not to issue a summons, um, but that um, the question of whether evidence was sufficient for a conviction was not a relevant consideration. So as long as the court is uh, satisfied that, the, uh, that there, there is uh, pre-professional evidence for all the elements of the offence, that should be sufficient. Um, and commercial background um, is relevant, but not necessarily determinative. It would depend on the circumstances. And more recently, it's also been held that failings in the duty of candor may not be determinative where there was no disadvantage to the defendant. So... Um, the question remains really now whether there is a sufficient protection for private 
uh, for defendants in private prosecutions. Certainly, I can see there's more work to be done on costs and no doubt the public inquiry will uh, come up with some recommendations. But what there's one thing that I think could be added right now, which is the um, requirement that any when a summons is issued and served on a defendant, that the defendant should be notified that the CPS has a power to take to, to review um, so that they're completely on notice of that because not everyone is represented and um, we'd hope that most criminal lawyers would know this very well but of course that may not always be the case so um, this would make it very clear. The House of Justice Common, uh, Select Committee, the House of Commons Select Committee did um, recommend this but there's it's not been enacted and there's a new rule 7-4 but that only mandates that the summons, when, when the summons is served, the prosecutor should be named. So making it clear that it's um, a private prosecutor, but it leaves it to chance whether the defendant would discover the CPS's potential role in their case. So, so that was the, my first section. Um, and I know that I'm, I'm hoping to get all of this done in my sort of 20, 25 minute slot and someone's going to give me a bit of a nudge to hurry up or move on if, if I don't, because I'm now on to my sort of middle section, which is offences by omission. Um, and I was sort of, my interest in, in this was Pete, was Pete really because of um, offences like the, um, the, the failure to put reports of suspicions of money laundering under section 330 of the Proceeds of Crime Act. And also the Section 7, re, seven corporate offence, Section 7 of the Bribery Act, corporate offence of a, a commercial organisation failing to prevent bribery and other um, similar offences in, in that, of that kind. Of course, we're soon to be, um, uh, have another one, which is um, failing to prevent fraud. So, um, in his, so, in his, so, um, in looking at this, I, I was, um, Matt actually drew my attention to Professor Andrew Ashworth's uh, book on positive obligations in the criminal law. Uh, and that, uh, I think is fair to say, is it covers a huge range of uh, cr criminalised not doings, as he likes to call them. And, and I couldn't possibly do justice to, to all of the different categories uh, that he has looked at. But he did look in criminalising omissions at um, what he called duty situations, which can arise out of a voluntarily incurred or civic obligation. Um, and that's where uh, somebody decides they want to enter a certain type of activity and therefore duty is imposed on them, compliance is expected, and then it's a, a, an offence not to comply. And so the section 330 POCA offence is one of those because the duty is imposed on people who choose to work in a regulated sector, and then they are required to report a possible crime, suspicions of money laundering, if they know or suspect or have reasonable grounds for knowing or suspecting that another person is engaged in money laundering. Uh, and if they don't do that, it's an offence. Uh, and he, Professor Ashworth argued that those working in regulated businesses can be expected to understand their legal obligations and to exercise a heightened diligence. And so such offence was not objectionable, but he did consider the maximum sentence of five years imprisonment, which is the same as for failing to report suspicion of terrorist activity was disproportionately high given the wrong involved. Um, when, when the uh, Proceeds of Crime, Crime Act was introduced, the Attorney General um, is on record as envisaging that the prosecution for such an offence would only occur where money laundering was in fact taking place. However, that's not what the statute actually says. And in 2021, the CPS amended its guidance to state that there's no requirement to prove a predicate offence. Uh, and some saw that as a sort of green light to, to, to prosecuting standalone offences. Um, I'm not aware of an example of a prosecution for uh, a section 330 offence for negligently failing to recognise the signs of an offence that hasn't committed, hasn't been committed. But, um, uh, uh, and we, I would hope that we never will because I think that would be a disproportionate and unnecessary approach given the intentions behind the act. The corporate failing to prevent offences do require proof of predicate offence, if not convictions, as we all know. Um, so, um, uh, and it, the, the, the Bribery Act, the Section 7 offence was the first in a series of, of those corporate emissions offences of strict liability uh, um, albeit subject to inadequate procedures defence. 
it was introduced to circumvent the cumbersome identification doctrine um, for crim corporate criminal liability um, and as a means of coercing companies to improve anti-bribery culture in their organizations. So a company can be guilty where it, it can be proved that it failed to prevent bribes being paid uh, by an associated, associated person for contracts that benefit the company but it's a defence to show that they had adequate procedures in place to prevent that. We then moved on to um, failing to prevent the facilitation of tax evasion in the Criminal Finances Act, and now we've landed on failing to prevent fraud under the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. These, these offences have sort of emerged in parallel with the developing um, practice, uh, and, well, introduction first of all, and then developing practice around the third prosecution agreements for corporates. Um, and we will have all read in the news about uh, the admissions to, uh, of responsibility and the enormous financial penalties that have been paid, uh, which is no doubt very pleasing to the Treasury. But the success in holding corporate feet to the fire has been accompanied by a distinct lack of convictions of individual with some notable collapsed trials, for example, Tesco's and more recently G4S, uh, the outcomes leading to speculation that, well, the corporates are driven by risk management and a desire to move on and so may not always um, be so concerned about the strength or the quality of the evidence. That's uh, in, in complete, uh, the complete opposite with individuals who are going to fight tooth and nail as they're the ones who get imprisoned if they're convicted. And this does nothing for this two-tier system that's emerging, I would say, does nothing for public trust and confidence uh, and is a very much unwanted consequence of those well known efforts to tackle financial crime. And so it could be that the, the new offence in the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill has arrived just when those in unintended consequences are being really laid bare. Um, and, um, uh, and so has led me to ask whether there is another way of regulating corporates in their duties to prevent harm and crime. And one such example is the online safety bill where um, Ofcom, uh, when it's enacted, will be responsible for regulating the companies who will have a duty, these are the internet uh, companies, that will have a duty to remove harmful content and so on. Uh, and Ofcom will be able to have powers to, in, to require measures to be implemented or issue fines or uh, apply for court orders to restrict the provision of services uh, and criminal, criminal sanctions are just limit, are limited to the simple offences of senior managers who fail to comply with information requirements. So in this instance, it will be Ofcom rather than a jury that will be responsible for deciding what is reasonable for a company to be expected to do. Uh, and the companies will have a right of appeal against decisions and penalties to the upper tribunal. And penalties will also not be the only game in town. So a more collaborative approach to enforcement is possible but it will put considerable powers in Ofcom to supervise compliance in a manner that uh, balances a number of needs, including, of course, the, the founding purpose of the act, which is protection for in consumers, which is much needed, but also the legitimate business interests of tech companies and also safeguarding uh, freedom of expression. Um, and finishing there with my finger on freedom of expression, we come then on to um, official secrets and um, recent developments that May, uh, may impact um, uh, what newspapers feel that they can report based on, for example, whistleblowing or provision of uh, confidential information. So um, the 1989 Official Secrets Act um, creates offences for mostly, I mean, for, for civil servants uh, uh, to the, that uh, protect the disclosure or re that relate to the disclosure of protected information in relation to specific areas like intelligence and defense and so on. And then there's also um, an offense under section five for a person who's received information uh, that has come to in their possession in breach of those one, sections one to four offenses. And many people who make disclosures or in the past have made disclosures in breach of the 1989 Act would claim that their disclosure is in the public interest. And with our benefit of hindsight, some of us may agree they probably were. However, there isn't a specific defense of acting in the public interest to a charge under the Official Secrets Act 1989. Um, so Clive Ponting, who was the, um, who leaked information to an MP 
that Parliament may have been misled about the sinking of an Argentinian ship in the Falklands War, um, sought to rely on that defence. He wasn't allowed to. The judge said the public interest is what the government of the day says it is. So that's quite uh, quite striking. Uh, but he was he was nonetheless acquitted um, in what was seen as a perverse verdict. So we'll never know what the Court of Appeal may have made of that ruling. And then there was David Shaler, who um, also also disclosed who disclosed material to journalists. His case was looked at in the Court of Appeal that held necessity defence is available uh, in, um, in 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 offences under sections one and four of the Act, uh, but wasn't available to him because uh, he didn't come near to um, meeting the, the the appropriate necessity test, which is very strict. Um, and yeah, I mean they they, they um, went over the, the, what the test is, which um, is very similar to any other necessity defence test. Um, and then, um, but he then appealed to the House of Lords. They declined to consider that necessity, to, whether that defence was available, made it clear that silence couldn't be taken as an endorsement. But they did also go on to look at whether he would have been entitled to rely on a public interest defence, i.e. that it, he believed that he was acting in the public interest. Um, and they held that um, such a defence couldn't apply under the particular provisions of the Official Secrets Act that he faced, which were sections 11A and section 4. And they also um, said that the Official Secrets Act, so far as sections 1 and 4 were concerned, were justified and were proportionate restrictions to Article 10 rights, because if a member of the security services wanted to make a disclosure, they could go and ask their line manager or, or something. And, uh, so it was, all, I think there was actually a special procedure, but I can't really imagine anyone wanting to use it. But anyway, they, um, that was what the House, House of Lords held. But um, it's also notable that the House of Lords was only concerned with offences under sections 1, 1A and 4 of the Act. Um, and those offences don't have a proof of damage requirement in them, which other offences do. And when, um, when the uh, 1989 Act was introduced, there was a white paper that preceded the Act. Five minutes left, apparently. Um, uh, and um, uh, and that, that made it clear that public interest is relevant to assessing whether disclosure is damaging. So uh, the House of Law's comments about proportionality in Article 10 rights were also confined to Sections 11A and 4. So I'm just going to touch very quickly then on the Law Commission's report. They recommended a public interest defence. They felt that the current law uh, could, wasn't um, meant that prosecutions might not necessarily be Article 10 compliance, um, but the government didn't, well, I don't know whether the government, government agrees or doesn't, but it doesn't want to do anything about it. So it's not adopted any of those recommendations in the National Security Bill. It has adopted other recommendations, and that has led to quite a lot of consternation in the media as well about whistleblowers and um, the stifling of freedom of expression. Um, we probably haven't got time to look at it today, but people might want to look at Clause 3.2, uh, which is the facilitation offence, uh, which doesn't require a person to there to be any particular connection with a foreign inter intelligence service and appear apparently can be committed by anyone who happens to make uh, provide information that could be of assistance to a foreign intelligence service in some way. Um, and uh, there was also, for, for us, as those of us who are solicitors, Joshua, Joshua Rosenberg uh, wrote in the uh, Solicitors and Law Society Gazette quite recently about it as well. And he certainly feels that um, it, it, it's likely to be broad enough to capture journalistic activity, even if that's not what the government intends. And so just at a time when um, democracy is taking a lot, lot of knocks, it would appear that these are approaches to the protection of official data are another perhaps chink in the armour of our well-fought or well-founded freedoms. So that's uh, the end of my talk, you'll be pleased to hear probably. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm just going to hand over now. Yes, to, well, we decided we yeah. wanted to do question yeah, okay. and answer and we're hoping for a bit yeah. of audience participation. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I want to, to, there are three areas I want to comment yeah. on and ask you, I think. The first is in relation to the expectations on private prosecutors uh, in relation to the public interest. Mm 
and whether they're, they're reasonable. And I'm going to pose a controversial yeah. question. Okay. Secondly, how elastic is the concept and how coherent is the concept and what should judges do in relation to interpreting it? And should I make it clear, these are not the views of the English judiciary that I'm expressing. <laughs> these are comments for the purposes of this academic symposia. <laughs> symposium. Next and last comment I want to make is about defences and whether it's necessary to have a general defence mm -hmm. or what type of defences we may need to incorporate a public interest defence into. Okay, so my first comment is that given that the qualified right <clears throat> is retained for, to privately prosecute individuals and companies. I'd like your views on the coherence of the law in relation to this and the development possibilities. So the code test will should be regard, taken into consideration by private prosecutors. But I'm going to read two things, um, one from 2007 from Lord Bingham, uh, where he said in the case of Jones and Wally, <clears throat> the surviving right of private prosecution is of questionable value and can be exercised in a way damaging to the public interest. So that's 2007. Then we have Lord Mance in 2013 in the case of Gurja, where he described the traditional English, sorry, the traditional, can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me? the traditional English view that the right to institute a private prosecution is an important right and safeguard possessed by any aggrieved citizen. And he went on to say that it also provides a safeguard against wrongful refusal or failure by public prosecuting authorities to institute proceedings. And so that's, uh, there's an incoherence potentially, but I want to ask you this question in relation to the exercising of the public interest test in private prosecutions. Are we expecting too much of private prosecutors for them to be able to identify what the public interest requires them to do? And why do we assume an audience participation allowed that their narrow private interests are somehow illegitimate? Well, uh, first of all, I think it may ask a, a bit much because they don't necessarily have oversight over all of the considerations that um, a state prosecutor might have. Um, they might not know that much about the, the background of the accused. They might not know the sort of overarching, um, the, for, for example, information about the prevalence of the offence or and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and I also think it's quite hard to do those mental gymnastics of thinking, well, I think this is a justified case. I'm a victim. I've been wronged. Why shouldn't I bring this um, and not be able to step back and actually then think, well, maybe I shouldn't bring this case because of A, B and C. Um, and, but, but the, um, sorry, the, I've just, what was the second question? I wrote it down, but I can't read my Latin. Um, um, it, why do we assume, as it seems that we yeah. do, that their narrow private interests are in some right, way illegitimate? Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I think where we've or do got we got to, assume that? I don't, I think there was an assumption, um, but I think that has been displaced in more recent years. And those more recent decisions about the commercial background being, um, for example, in commercial cases, which quite often they are, being a consideration, but not something to, to be frowned upon. Uh, there have been remarks. Uh, that it's perfectly legitimate to, to bring a, a private prosecution and, and of course there's bound to be a kind of private context to it but that doesn't yeah. that doesn't mean that it's it's wrong to bring a prosecution uh thank you very much for coming back in at least respectable if not just time uh so moving straight on to our next uh session uh, this is uh, from Dr. Renzo Pasculi, and uh, a, a slight change in commentator. Our previously arranged commentator uh, got stuck in court as of this morning, uh, but we are very lucky that a long-standing attendee and uh, very um, uh, up-and-coming young barrister, Vincent Scully, was able to step in today. So don't be aggressive in any questions <laughs> to the commentator. It's <laughs> really well out of bounds. Um, anyway, move straight on to the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me.
and uh, thanks to Bindman's in general and Katie in particular. Sorry, with a with the fan, yes. <laughs> I hear that. Sorry. I was thanking Matt for inviting me and thanks Katie and Bansman's in general for hosting the event. And thanks to Vincent, uh, which really helped a lot. Uh, he's stepping in and reading the papers in no time, basically, and actually absorbing them very well from the comments I heard so far. So why are we talking about today is something slightly different than pure legal analysis because it's a criminological or sociological take on the law. So what we'll try to do is to interpret how the law can actually enable systemic corruption. So the order of my presentation will follow four steps. The first one is a bit of a background and research objectives. This is a paper that is based on long-standing research that I've been conducting in a few years. So of course I will outline that in the first bit, second bit, the methods, third bit, the main findings. This is a crucial and central part of the paper. And finally, few possible recommendations or solutions that we can all then discuss, agree, disagree. This is an academic paper. So as I was saying to Vincent, uh, the, the objective is not to prove I'm right or wrong. The objective is to throw problems at the audience and, and tell you what I found, and then we can all build our uh, idea of what the facts and the truth can be, if there's any truth in scientific research. So, background and objectives. 300 years ago, Montesquieu said, quote, there are two sorts of corruptions, one when the people do not observe the laws, and the other when they are corrupted by the laws. An incurable evil, because it is in the very remedy itself. And this is a problem that we have today and we are getting increasingly aware of that the law, which we think it's the remedy to crime and corruption, can actually become the enabler. So my research in the last few years, I've been focusing on finding case studies in which I could analyze the law from a legal kind of practitioners and, uh, and academic perspective, but in a criminological lens to analyze how the law interacts with the factors that generate crime corruption and systematize it across entire sectors of society. So this is the purpose of the paper. Now, before moving on to the findings and the methods, I need to clarify what I mean by systemic corruption, because the, the definition can be controversial. So I want to give the real or the final definition. I will give a working definition that I find conventionally helpful to understand my research. The same I will do with the law. I will present the definition that I use in the papers to describe the law, not the universal or final definition of the law. I'm no philosopher, I'm a lawyer, so I'm practical in this respect. What I mean by corruption is the abuse of power for private gain, of course, but I mean it in a systemic way. So I mean when these abuse, abuse is normalized across broad sectors of society when it is normal to abuse these powers. Now, powers mean something that comes from the law, because in order for us to abuse a power, we need to have that power first. And it is the law that gives these powers. So in this definition, corruption implies the existence of laws that lend themselves or expose themselves to be abused. So corruption, as other people say, is a parasite to the legal system is a parasite of the law because it grows upon misinterpretation, misconceptions and abuses of the law that gives rights and powers. This definition also makes us understand that corruption is not equal to criminal or illegal behaviors only. Corruption can also be something which is formally compliant with the letter of the law, so technically legal, but still harmful or ethically debatable. And this is a very gray area, so it, it's a problematic area, but needs to be mentioned. So this is a novel approach to the problem. There are some previous studies that addressed the, the, the kind of unintended criminogenic consequences of the law, but no study before the kind of uh, trend that I inaugurated dealt with the problem of the systematization of these broadly intended practices. 
Second definition is the law. What do I mean by the law? I need to give this definition because a lot of studies before me focus on the law as legislation, the unintended consequences of legislation or re written regulations. I heard that in the first presentation by Katie as well, we talked about some unintended consequences of some regulation or some legislation. This is the common area in which we apply theoretical frameworks and research about unintended consequence. I want to expand this. So by law, I don't mean only legislation or written regulation, but I mean both the norms that can be also, for instance, in case law, and the institutions and the institutional frameworks that are in charge of enforcing those norms. So for instance, judicial interpretations, uh, enforcement practices, regulatory frameworks, and so on and so forth. In other words, this gives a new spin to this topic because it considers the law in action rather than the law in books. That said, we can move to the methods and I can be a bit short here because uh, we can discuss the methods perhaps more extensively in another occasion. What I did is, first of all, a literature review of the causes of systemic corruption from a social and individual standpoint. And what I need to mention here is that I came to organize these causes in a framework. Proximate causes are causes that relate to the individual and their close environment, the organization where they work, the people they frequent, and also, of course, the legal environment, the regulatory frameworks. Proximate causes include three main factors. First, opportunities. In order to commit a crime, there must be an opportunity. Secondly, motivations. So the impetus, the individual impetus to commit that offense. And finally, normalization. Normalization embed rationalization processes. Everyone does it. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't harm. It's actually legal and so on and so forth. Socialization of these patterns. So sharing these rationalization patterns, for instance, within an organization or within a, a group. And then institutionalization, which means actually translating these rationalization patterns into practice. And these can be done, for instance, in, I don't know, compliance frameworks or uh, the way a corporation addresses particular criminal problems. Together with the, the proximate causes, then we have the remote causes. And these are more slippery, I would say. So proximate, uh, remote causes are all these causes that are not related to the close environment of the individual, but rather to broader societal, cultural, or political developments. These are difficult to study, to categorize, and to understand. I do mention them in my papers, but with a very cautious approach because there's no real agreement on what these causes can be. But I will mention some of these throughout the discussion. The second step in my methodology was to review actually all the literature that discusses how the law can enable either criminal or corrupt behaviors. And there are a few kind of typologies here of papers. The first one on regulatory capture. This is something I'm less interested in because that's a deliberate corrupting effect, which is impressed upon the law. Whereas I'm interested in how the law can unintendedly create corruption. Second trend of literature or orientation is unintended consequences of regulation. This is more close to what I want to investigate, but generally it's a very vague and broad approach to any kind of regulation rather than a focus on particular corrupting effects of the law. The, the part of the literature which is closer to my work is some kind of limited research that has been conducted in the early 2000s on the criminogenic effects of legislation. So how legislation of all sorts can potentially trigger criminal behaviors. This has been very interesting for me and that helped me a lot in formulating the distinction between the different causes of corruption that I mentioned before. But this is incomplete because A, focuses only on legislation and B, focuses only on crime proper. So behaviors that are criminalized, not behaviors that are 
apparently compliant with the letter of the law, but actually escape its purposes. Secondly, it focuses only on legislation. So I wanted to check also the effects of case law and the enforcement practice, which is more administrative practice. Finally, there is some emerging literature, very recent, on how the legal system itself serves the interests of economy, financial interests mostly. There are historical researchers that focus on how the law has been developed in time, unintendedly, not as a criminal master plan, to serve mostly financial interest, and therefore it unintendedly penalized the interest of the individual against the interest of corporations. I'm less interested in these, but I think there's a lot to be explored there when it comes to the societal remote causes of corruption. After having reviewed all the literature on these topics, I moved on to my more original contribution, which is the study of three case studies from three different countries with similar but not too much legal systems. And these are Uganda, where there was a massive corruption scandal in the mining sector in 2018, 2017, sorry. The Australian banking industry scandal, which exploded in 2019 after decades of uh, uh, kind of, I would say, mostly press and media investigations. And then finally, the UK film industry tax relief scandal, which is still ongoing, whereby um, a lot of investors and companies are abusing of uh, tax relief that is designed for producers of films. So these cases were selected for many criteria, mostly because they were easy to um, kind of investigate because of the amount of evidence which is available. Other cases that I approached were not as reliable or they wouldn't give me enough material to study. So these three cases were actually the most ideal from a practical standpoint, and I will say my papers as well from a theoretical standpoint. Moving on, main findings. So what did I find out? I will give you first a gen general framework, so a framing of the problem. And secondly, I will dig deeper into some concrete examples to put the framework into practice and to let you understand the practical implications. So I realized that there are three main enablers of uh, crime and corruption in the law, and I call them juridical because they don't pertain only to legislation, but any possible source of law, including institutional practice. And these are divided in three categories, depending on the type of cause of corruption that they interact with. So juridical precipitators, I use here terminology that is borrowed from criminological theories. Juridical precipitators are all normative situations that actually either boost or create motivations to offend. Juridical opportunities are any legal situation that creates an opportunity that could be access to victims, the fact that there are no guardians to check a particular behaviors, so occasions to commit the offenses or to commit them more easily. And finally, juridical excuses. And these are normative or legal situations that facilitate rationalization processes and their socialization and institutionalization. The main findings, I will give some example in a second, but the main findings about these enablers are the following. First of all, juridical enablers are far from being confined in legislation. They actually affect any sort of source of the law. Secondly, they do not depend necessarily on defects, failures, shortcomings of the law. Sometimes we think about this problem in terms of legal loopholes. But this is a terminology I refrain from because actually even legitimate pieces of legislation or even legitimate judicial decision and perhaps even well-drafted ones can become criminogenic or corrupting if they interact with other elements of the system that are equally legitimate. So it, much of it depends on interactions between different enablers. Now, to make some examples, First of all, sometimes it's not 
the way the law is drafted or interpreted that is criminogenic, but the policy decision behind the law. For instance, the introduction of a new tax invites evasion by itself, simply because individuals are predisposed to save money. Not all of them, of course, but those who are more inclined to do that will be encouraged to commit tax evasion if a new tax is introduced. Silly example, but just to clarify, and then I will move to the case studies. And, and the, the, the decision on introducing a new tax is completely legitimate. It's not a failure of the system, it's not a problem, but that's a bit of a, an example. Secondly, of course, we can have problems of law design in which the wording is ambiguous and we enter here more in the pathology of the, of the, of the law. Uh, the judicial interpretations are not clear and so on and so forth. So these might be a matter of legal techniques that we can address and we can improve. Another area that creates these precipitators or opportunities or excuses is the way enforcement um, is approached. So for instance, if enforcement is too collaborative, we heard before the example of Ofcom as a regulator that should create a collaborative approach with internet providers, if the approach is too collaborative, that might undermine the deterrent effect of legislation. Equally, if the approach is selective, and this is something that happens, for instance, for HMRC, the resources are limited, we need to choose our battles and focus only a few cases, then that will create an awareness that actually we might get uh, kind of out of the radar of HMRC and therefore might be easier for us to commit avoidance or evasion. Judicial interpretation is exposed to the same shortcomings, but also we have intrinsic structural characteristic of the law which facilitate the systematization of this behavior. The law is general, it applies to everyone, it is abstract, it applies to all potential situations it regulates, it's durable, it tends to resist through long periods of time, and it's malleable, it can be interpreted. So these features of the law repeat the criminogenic effects of one disposition of one provision across entire sectors that are regulated by it. Finally, there are more systemic or structural problems, such as how complex a legal framework is. I tell you, when I was trying to address the last paper I wrote on this, which is on tax abuse, I was, I'm, I'm a criminal lawyer, I was really struggling to make my way through tax law to the extent that I had to have a co-author who is an expert in tax law, because I couldn't possibly understand tax law myself. I, I'm not particularly brilliant, but I put myself in the shoes of someone who's not a lawyer and is trying to understand the law. So complexity, fragmentariness, or sometimes even legitimate parts of the law that unintendedly end up in serving criminal intentions in other areas of the law. For instance, the availability or the easy access to business structures in the UK serves very well the interests of those who want to create fraudulent uh, companies to evade taxes, and so on and so forth. Now, moving on to the examples, the first case I'm uh, getting close to the time, but I think we should be good. First case was the Uganda mining sector. Just to point out the main enablers there, what happened is there was a massive uh, kind of report from Global Witness, which is an NGO, on how the mining system was entirely corrupt. There was bribery, smuggling, and uh, there was you know, labor exploitation, land exploitation, a lot of behaviors that are properly criminal here. There's no, not even that kind of shades of gray that I mentioned before. Now, one could easily say, well, but Uganda has a corrupt regime or there is a corrupt culture and so on and so forth. And this is why I compare this case study with Australia and the UK, which are top in the rankings of non-corrupt countries. And I can conclude that it's not just the cultural fabric of society. It's also the way that law interacts with this fabric. So the Mining Act, the main flaw is that it gives very broad and unchecked powers, so discretion, to the mining authorities. That invited bribery, that allowed them to go 
beyond the law requirements or interpret the law requirements very flexibly. They also undermine the anti-corruption provisions because of course they gave more special provisions to which um, offenders could cling to, to say, hey, this provision actually undermines the general anti-corruption anti provisions. Moving on to Australia. The Australian case is more significant because it gives us an idea of how the law, which is actually intended to responsibilize corporations, the case here is the banking sector, as I said before, can actually facilitate their de-responsibilization. Excessive discretion to corporations in managing crime risks and excessive discretion to regulators even in enforcing the law ended up in very weak control, very weak enforcement and a corporate environment that actually justified misconduct as just negligence or another one was merely inappropriate but not illegal. So these are the examples from Australia. I can go in detail if you want in the Q&A. Finally, the UK introduced tax reliefs for free producers to encourage, of course, investment, perfectly legitimate. But the way in which these legal provisions were worded and interacted with commercial law, previous judicial interpretation, and the existence and availability of business structures enabled the creation of companies namely partnerships that were not technically involved in film production, but they were just buying and reselling rights to movies from big studios. And they called this, well, we are investing in movies, therefore we are involved in film production. That was an example of tax avoidance, but an example of tax evasion was actually companies making completely up the fact that they were creating movies and then they say, oh, sorry, that movie didn't go well, we didn't manage to create it, but we still claim back the benefits because we invested on it. Of course, at the extreme end of the scale, there are cases of false invoices and completely fraudulent schemes, but there are a lot of in-betweens here. Interestingly here, this is the case that demonstrates more the impact of case law because a lot of these schemes were actually based and justified by the perp perpetrators or ideators as compliant with the interpretation that courts had given previously to similar pieces of legislation. Final point, solutions, and then I conclude, and I think we're quite in time. The first conclusion is that I don't think it's possible to have laws that are risk-free. So a certain degree of unintended consequences must be accepted Otherwise, we're going to be called utopian or irrealistic and so on and so forth. But there are some practices, processes and techniques which I kind of I scanned, I found through the literature that might help perhaps proofing the law a bit more against corruption risks. Legal reform as such is not only insufficient because it only addresses specific provisions, but sometimes even counterproductive because crime adapts. The problem that we deal here with is that crime adapts to the rules of the game. Crime finds ways to circumvent the rules. So the more we create rules, the more we push criminals to find ways out of them. So the focus is on three main areas. I think, first of all, legislative processes, how we make them. Are we considering crime risks when we make laws? There are suggestions to include crime risk assessment steps in legislative processes around the world. There could be also be special guidance on how the law can create crime or corruption risks. And I think one thing the UK does very well is the systematic review of legislation, which other countries don't do, for instance, Australia. The second point is, much as we care about legislative processes, as I said before, sometimes the problem is in policy decision making. So policy making processes must also be proofed against crime. This can be done, for instance, by creating specific advisory roles or specific uh, teams. The UK did that with the coronavirus uh, support schemes for businesses and follow they created a policy advisory team that actually went to policymakers and say, this policy can create the risk of fraud. This policy must be implemented in this way. Otherwise, fraudster will take advantage of it. 
And I think, why only fraud? Why can't we do this with all the crimes that are more susceptible to these particular risks? Finally, of course, education, information, awareness raising, and training for any institution, courts, lawmakers, and also uh, law enforcement agencies or regulators about these risks is paramount because if there is awareness of this, then perhaps the way that enforcers interpret, enforce, and approach the law might be different than what they do today. That's everything for me. I hope I was in time. Thank you for listening and thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, I've got two thoughts or questions about enablers that I want to sort of raise. And this is based on your definition in your uh, paper, which was circulated beforehand, uh, of enablers as being things which contribute to someone's readiness to offend effectively. Uh, and the first is effectively about the moral dimension of these, because I think that enablers pose a moral question about someone's culpability for crimes they've committed. If someone's in what are statistically particularly criminogenic circumstances, for example, they're growing up in a particularly deprived area, they've, through no fault of their own, uh, lost a parent, uh, had a bad education, things like that, are they less culpable for the crimes they go on to commit? For example, gang violence. Uh, and then there's the converse of that, which is that if someone commits a crime without any criminogenic circumstances, you know, they've had the best possible upbringing and then they go on to you know, deal drugs or whatever. Um, they've had every opportunity to lead a crime-free life. Are they more culpable for the crimes they commit? Uh, and even if that, that doesn't make a difference to their liability for offences, which I don't think anyone would suggest it would, uh, is it a factor relevant to sentence? Now, I would suggest that we don't generally recognise general criminogenic circumstances um, as being a mitigating factor for circumstances uh, for for offences. Uh, you know, the fact of your ethnicity is unlikely to um, be considered a mitigating factor if you commit a gang murder. Um, but on the other hand, uh, what about in the tax context? Uh, if evasion is committed in circumstances where there are no juridical enablers, uh, is it worse if the law is absolutely clear about the taxes you ought to be paying uh, and you've broken it, unlike uh, in your uh, film tax scheme examples? <laughs> and I think many people would say that ought to be an aggravating factor. Uh, and is the fact that we <clears throat> might be treating those two things differently um, consistent? So that's my sort of thought slash question about um, moral, the moral dimension of um, enablers. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about that before I move on to my- As you um, wish, as you wish. Oh, wait, 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 I'll let you have a- Sure. So <laughs> this is a very interesting issue and it actually, actually very spot on. So the issue broadly relates to how do we tackle the causes of criminality in criminal law as such? So do we want to give space to the causes of crime, whether they're individual or societal or environmental, in sentencing, the kind of setting responsibilities, criminalizing, do we keep them into account or not? And this, if you want to go even backwards, that boils down to determinism of free will, right? So how much does the context affect us? And this is true also for the legal context. I don't take a position on these issues in my papers because they're highly sophisticated and partly even highly moral and philosophical issues that go beyond the scope of my research. But I have the feeling, and I'm just improvising here, that they shouldn't be reflected on the way we determine culpability. The, the way to address the problem is the other way around. Instead of pointing to a higher or lesser culpability, the criminogenic effects of the law point at the need to responsibilize the state more for the way the state does things. So if the state demands individuals to be responsible, then the prohibitions, the prescriptions, and the commands of the law must be clear. 
if the state wants to impose penalties, then the powers related to these penalties must be appropriately regulated. One example is from the Australian case study. The Australian government, uh, through legislation, gave powers to prudential and security regulators to enforce the law against uh, corporations, exactly like we do with the FCA. So regulators have broad powers and they can prosecute corporations. Now, these powers in Australia were extremely broad and deregulated. That created a massive pocket of discretion for regulators who started creating their own approach and their own guidelines. Without guidance from the top level, which is parliament or government, according to the competences, these brought the regulator to be too sympathetic with regulated subjects with whom they had daily contacts because corporations were involved in uh, regulatory guidance, in setting standards, they were consulted regularly. So they, would be, they became naturally good collaborators. And the purpose of appointing a regulator is also to increase collaboration. But that ended up in completely disintegrated the effectiveness of the enforcement action of the regulator. Now, this is not the individual, which is more or less culpable. We can't say the corporations are less culpable because of the ineptitude of the regulator or the legislator. But we can say, if we don't want to, to address this problem, then the state must behave properly and the state must do the rules and set the system properly. So my papers are not seeking to demonstrate that individuals are less culpable for their circumstances. They might well be, but I don't enter into that territory. My papers are a denunciation of how states are actually failing to address issues that should be their own responsibility. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'll move on to my second point um, to avoid falling foul of uh, Matt's timekeeping. Uh, <laughs> So uh, and my second point was about, uh, obviously, this paper is about uh, juridical uh, enablers. Um, but even beyond uh, your third category of juridical enablers, which are juridical excuses, uh, which remind everyone it, you defined as situations that provide or reinforce rationalization patterns, um, which in turn can also contribute to the socialization and institu institutionalization of corruption. Um, we also go into, I would suggest, entirely non-juridical enablers of crime as well. Um, so the social acceptability of tax fraud is sometimes not affected by juridical enablers at all. Uh, so the celebrities involved in uh, the third scheme, I think it's called the Imagine Film scheme, yes. uh, obviously all felt they were in it together, I suspect. Uh, and it could be said to be a consequence of the juridical enablers, for example, the lax enforcement and the legal ambiguity. Um, but I think it could also be argued that social acceptance is by itself important. Um, and as a sort of example of this, I looked up this afternoon, having found I was going to be doing this, uh, the drink driving statistics, which I think are quite telling. So uh, if we start in 1979, which is the furthest back government statistics go, 1979, there are 19 and a half thousand collisions involving drink drivers uh, and over 1,300 deaths. 40 years later, by 2019, there are four and a bit thousand collisions and 210 deaths. So it's fallen sort of 75 ish percent um, collisions and a bit more for deaths. And obviously, cars and roads have got safer, but also it fell as a percentage. Um, many fewer road deaths uh, were called would involved a drink driver as a percentage so it went from 26 percent to 13 uh, percent and even since 2010 uh, there's a survey of a national national statistics survey uh, about self-reported drink driving and that's fallen by a third in the last 13 years and um, the point of all this is that the law in this area has remained effectively the same as has law enforcement, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and I would suggest this is entirely down to the government's PR campaigns about killing your child, the annual uh, adverts on TV around Christmas time. <sighs> so juridical enablers, I'd suggest, only take us so far. Uh, and in aiming to reduce crime, we also have to consider 
things like social attitudes and an entirely sociological approach, as well as the law driven approach. Um, and perhaps therefore we should have HMRC annual anti-avoidance ad campaigns at the um, 15th of January on television um, in order to be stopping um, those of us who do their own tax returns yeah. um, from putting uh, incorrect things in them. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, the, 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 the theory or the findings that I'm proposing are not meant to resolve all the causes of crime, but they're meant to expose how the law can aggravate exactly the causes you mentioned. So if there's a cultural or social predisposition in a particular country to corruption or to bribery or a social acceptability of bribery or tax evasion, should not perhaps the law incorporate elements that keep these into account? to counter it. So that could be easily done, for instance, through an, a legislative requirement for a regulator to commit resources to the type of campaigns that you're mentioning. So the law has a role to play. So my point is exposing how the law can aggravate or potentially counter precisely those societal conditions that can facilitate crime. Obviously, I'm not claiming, and I will never do, that if we prove the law against crime, then we'll have no crime. Absolutely. Just to be clear, in case there was a shadow of doubt, I'm saying the law plays a role. The more we learn about it, the more we share ideas as we're doing today about it, the more we'll be able to maximize the effectiveness of the positive role and minimize the negative role. Well, I'm glad to hear you're not planning to put us out of the job. No. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you ever so much. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, attending thus far. We have our last and uh, particularly fascinating talk. As you might have gathered, we try to run the gamut in a number of ways in our presentations. We try to cover not only uh, doctrinal substantive criminal law, but criminal procedure and criminal evidence. We try to cover criminal justice more broadly and some criminal theory where we can. So we try to cover the spectrum. And as you've gathered so far, we've had a, a lot of procedural but also substantive paper. We've had a more a wider criminal justice and also criminological paper, but with doctrinal elements. And we now move towards this sort of doctrinal and theory end with a paper on how does criminal law recklessness differ from negligence and knowledge. There should be a handout available on the seats. If you haven't got one in front of you, it's just because they didn't know where you were sitting when they kindly put them out. So there should be a spare one somewhere. Oh, it's underneath you, all right. Um, so that is, there, right. is there an extra for me? Uh, <laughs> yes, there can be. Try to remember what I said. <laughs> no, no, no. I wonder if you might want to sit on the side so that they can You're going to use this. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Richard. No worries. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we're very, very lucky and imported fresh from the USA. We have Ken Simons with us, uh, a fabulous scholar of tort law and criminal law, and the, uh, the um, comment will be given by Adrian Waterman Casey from Matrix. So straight over to you, Ken. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you for uh, sticking here till the, till the very end. I'll try to keep this lively because I know it's the last uh, session of the day. Thanks, Matt, for uh, organizing a wonderful uh, afternoon and to Feynman's for, for hosting this. So um, my uh, uh, outline uh, of a paper that I distrib had distributed, um, I'm going to try to summarize it in this uh, set of PowerPoints. And the main thing I'm focusing on here uh, and something I've written about for many years, but I'm uh, eager to expand on some of my past work is the meaning of some of the key mental states that are used in the criminal law, and especially for today's purposes, uh, recklessness, how it differs from negligence on the one hand and from knowledge on the other. Uh, and I'm going to suggest there's some difficulties with the, the standard view uh, that advertence is what makes recklessness worse, more culpable than negligence, advertence to risk. Uh, I'm going to suggest there are dimensions of advertence that are, uh, or awareness of risk that are complex and subtle and scalar rather than binary that are a matter of degree. Uh, there are complicated and really interesting questions about how justifiability of the risk itself 
is relevant to these different kinds of mental state categories. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, I want to say a little bit about moving beyond cognitive criteria of, such as belief and uh, suspicion uh, and should have believed those kinds of criteria to other kinds of criteria such as culpable indifference and gross uh, uh, negligence. Um, so the, let me just start with uh, some definitions from the model penal code. I'm quite aware that this does not govern law in England. It actually doesn't govern the law in the United States either, but it, its categories have been borrowed by quite a few American states. And uh, as far as I can tell, very similar concepts are used uh, in, uh, in, in England. Uh, so the definition of knowledge for, uh, and um, the, most of the examples that I've talked about today deal with mental state as to a result element of a crime, such as causing a death and homicide, causing criminal damage, uh, causing uh, harm to a person in a battery or assault. So uh, knowledge means uh, being aware that it's practically certain that your conduct will cause a result. Um, recklessness uh, means you have to consciously disregard a substantial and unjustifiable risk, uh, which involves a gross deviation from the standard uh, of conduct. Uh, I should have actually emphasized the language substantial risk here. The idea is Con being conscious of a risk and nevertheless going forward, but not necessarily uh, uh, being aware that it's practically certain that your conduct will kill someone or will harm them. Uh, negligence is the idea uh, that you should be aware of uh, a, a substantial risk uh, uh, and your failure to perceive it is, is uh, unreasonable. Now, how do these distinctions matter or when do they matter? Uh, one uh, area where they matter is if a particular crime happens to have various levels according to uh, mental state, that's the, certainly the situation uh, in I think almost all jurisdictions for homicide. In the United States, knowingly causing a death counts as murder. Uh, I believe the notion of uh, indirect uh, or oblique intention uh, is similar uh, in, in uh, England uh, and may count as murder. Recklessly causing a death, uh, uh, causing a death aware of the, uh, that, that there was a risk of death in what you did uh, counts as involuntary manslaughter under the MPC and in some states, other states uh, apply more of a negligence or a gross negligence standard. But the other place this is really important is as the minimum mens rea for a crime. Most crimes don't have various degrees. Uh, the model people actually suggests for assault, there should be an intentional assault category and then a reckless causing harm, lesser degree of assault. But most American states haven't adopted that. So usually the, the reason these distinctions matter is for the minimum mens rea for a crime. Um, and then the standard view about how to distinguish recklessness from negligence is to focus on the actor's awareness of the risk. Uh, if the person's aware of a risk, for example, if a driver decides to go through a red light and they, they see a <laughs> pedestrian nearby, but they re just really want to get home soon and they're willing to take the risk and they consciously choose to make that choice, there's some special kind of culpability in knowing that you're running a risk, being aware of the risk, and nevertheless disregarding it and going forward, a uh, negligent actor who uh, should have been paying more attention but was distracted by a conversation with their, the person in the car uh, and never saw the person, they might be guilty of negligent homicide if they were to kill the person uh, uh, or maybe uh, depending on how the crimes def de 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 defined, but uh, there's, the person doesn't seem to make a culpable choice. So this is uh, a standard reason uh, and a very plausible reason for distinguishing reckless as a, a categorical and general matter from negligence. Um, but there are complications to this account. And um, one of the complications I wanna mention is what degree of belief in risk is required? Um, what does recklessness require in terms of the probability the defendant would subjectively assign to the risk? Uh, I think almost uh, 
all courts would say if the person believes the probability is one in a million of the bad result occurring, that doesn't count as being aware of a risk. It has to be somewhat more, has to be non-trivial, has to be more than that. But how great does it have to be? Well, there's some complexity here. Uh, is a belief in a 1% risk of a bad outcome sufficient? Well, maybe it should be sufficient if the outcome is death. On the other hand, if the outcome you're talking about is property damage, maybe in light of that being a much lesser invasion of others' interests, uh, maybe we should require 10% for substantiality or, or for at least significance. So uh, this is one, uh, I think, uh, uncertainty about the scope of the notion of awareness of a risk. Um, a second complication uh, is, I think, uh, less noticed, but is really, really serious. Does the belief have to be a current? Does it have to be occupying your mind? You have to be focusing on the fact, oh, there's the pedestrian. I might, I might hit them, oh, what the heck, I'll go through uh, anyway and hope that I don't. Uh, but that seems like a pretty demanding test to say that uh, you don't count as being uh, aware of a risk unless it's completely preoccupying is the only thing or the main thing you're thinking about at the moment would make it really hard to satisfy uh, a recklessness test. Uh, on the other hand, is it enough that if asked, the defendant would say, yes, that might happen. Um, uh, the, the notion of what they would spontaneously say, and now somehow you give them a truth serum so you know that they're telling the truth. What would they say if uh, asked at the moment? There are a lot of things that we believe and are aware of, but that aren't in uh, uh, uppermost in our thoughts at this very moment. Uh, all of you know that the uh, King Charles was recently coronated, but until I just mentioned it, you were thinking about it, but you were aware of it, uh, even though it was uh, latent. So the question is, to what extent can these more latent forms of uh, awareness count for purposes of the criminal law? Um, another uh, complication is the specificity with which uh, 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 that's required for your awareness of risk. So uh, is it uh, uh, necessary that you advert to a very concrete and imminent risk? Uh, the example I gave of seeing, actually seeing a pedestrian walking in front of you and thinking you can get around them without hitting them, but saying, what the heck, I hope I don't hit them, but I know there's a chance I would, uh, that's the, the clearest form of advertence to risk. But what about the notion of being aware of a general risk that conduct of a particular kind might create? So suppose you're texting while driving. It's hard, it, it's, uh, it, if you're texting at the very moment you're texting, you don't see the pedestrian, then, uh, uh, then in, under the first uh, view, you're not aware of the risk. On the other hand, if you were to truthfully answer the question, do you know it's dangerous to text while driving? I think a person would say, yes, I know it's dangerous. It greatly increases the risk that I will cause harms that I could have avoided if I were not focusing on my phone instead of uh, focusing on, on the road. And that's true for a lot of examples. One example I give in, in the paper is driving around a blind curve. If you go very fast around a blind curve such that you uh, should realize you don't have time to stop if there's a car coming the other way. Is it sufficient to just know this type of conduct is dangerous? Uh, if that's enough for awareness, then uh, a lot of things count as being advertent. If you have to actually see the car uh, uh, that's coming in your direction before you count as being aware of the risk, that might be too demanding. Uh, that might be uh, 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 treating this uh, as too uh, narrow a test. Uh, and I think this is a really serious problem in understanding awareness tests and how broad they are. Um, there's an obvious uh, 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 criminal law category that, that addresses this kind of problem, which is voluntary intoxication. Uh, there's a tend I know English courts do what most American courts also do. They tend to say, if you, uh, as a result of voluntary intoxication or unaware of a risk, you would have been aware of if you were sober, we treat you as if you were aware of the risk. Now that's a 
particular rule of law that may or may not make policy sense. But uh, notice that uh, another way of, uh, of dealing with that type of situation is to say, well, people when they drive know that if they're drunk while driving, they're going to be a little less able or maybe a lot less able to focus on the road and see what the risks are. So on, again, on the broader notion of I know that drunk driving increases the chance I won't see people in, uh, who I might run over, this might count as being aware of the risk. You wouldn't even need the special doctrine of voluntary intoxication. Um, another complication, um, Glanville Williams wrote some interesting uh, 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 commentary about this issue of the overly confident actor. Uh, suppose this person believes his conduct poses no risk. I think there's a is it the Shimon case where someone uh, tries to kick a, a glass uh, uh, partition or something and thinks that, he, that he's skillful enough to get very close but not actually hit it. Well, he's a little bit off and he does end up hitting it. Well, uh, there does seem to be something odd about saying someone who is so supremely self-confident and so self-deluded as to think that they are posing no risk when they also realize that almost anyone else in that situation would realize they're, they're posing a risk. Should that person really be treated as, as inadvertent at most being negligent? It, it makes a certain amount of sense to say perhaps uh, they should be treated as reckless or the way I put it at the end of this slide, if there's no justifiable reason for him to be so confident, he seems about as a culpable as an actor who is aware that they might break that glass uh, uh, door or window uh, uh, and nevertheless goes ahead and takes the risk. Um, and now what are the implications of these complications? Um, I think uh, one thing it shows is the supposed advantage of the uh, advertence account, the awareness of risk account of recklessness are a bit overstated. It's much more complex than you initially appears. There are all kinds of conceptual and practical problems with drawing the distinction, uh, but, and there are very difficult factual and normative questions we still need to explore. Uh, another issue that comes up, and, and this goes a little bit more to the distinction between recklessness and knowledge, uh, is the question of unjustifiability of the risk. Uh, in order for you to be guilty of a crime of uh, recklessly causing harm, uh, it must be the case that uh, it, it was an unreasonable risk to run or you were, it was an unjustifiable risk to impose on others. Uh, obviously, doctors who get the consent of their patients but nevertheless cause bad, uh, unfortunate negative side effects are not guilty of uh, recklessly causing physical harm to their patients. One thing that's interesting, though, is uh, under the model penal code, and to, as far as I can tell, and under English law, lack of justification is part of the very definition of negligence and of recklessness. Uh, you aren't reckless uh, uh, if you are running a reasonable risk. You are only reckless if it's an unjustifiable risk that you're posing. However, if you're dealing with a crime that involves knowledge or purpose, if you are uh, charged with purposely causing the death of another, uh, justification only can come in by way of a defense and probably a fairly limited one, such as self-defense or necessity or defense of others. Uh, I think uh, it doesn't actually make sense for lack of justification to be literally part of the definition of mens rea terms like negligence and recklessness, because it's really an actus reus requirement. It's a requirement that the risk you're posing is an unjustifiable risk. It would actually make more sense to treat that outside. But I think one of the main reasons it is included is because uh, of drafting. It's just a simpler way to draft a statute. <laughs> it's like using the word knowing in a criminal statute. Knowingly possessing illegal drugs is a crime okay, that's a mens rea requirement. You have to believe you're possessing the drug and it's an actus reus requirement. Uh, you have to actually be in possession of, of those drugs. So there may be a practical reason for it, but I think in principle, it would be good to uh, think through uh, the fact that it's 
it's actually an actus reus requirement. And the, the principal explanation of the asymmetry of why we might put the burden, for example, on the prosecution to prove that a negligent or reckless actor uh, was creating unjustifiable risk, but we might put the burden uh, of proof or at least of uh, production on the defendant on knowingly or purposely causing harm is that creating smaller risks of harm are easier to justify. Uh, generally speaking, the kind of justifications that suffice for causing harm with negligence and recklessness are wider in scope. There's a broader range of considerations. It doesn't have to fit into self-defense or necessity. It could be a whole broad range of, certain, certain, of, of reasons that can justify you. So in my example at the bottom here, imposing a very small risk of death might be perfectly acceptable for an ambulance driver, even if they're only avoiding a health risk to a patient, but the, the patient isn't in, in danger of dying. Um, because you're only imposing a small risk, but as, if the ambulance decides, I'm going to go right through this crowd of people and probably kill one of them, it's going to be awfully hard to justify that uh, and, and for good reason. So the, the asymmetry, I think, uh, does make some sense here. Um, and then, I, again, I think degree of unjustifiability is, uh, uh, is something that could be taken into account to a larger extent than it currently is. Perhaps it's sentencing, it, it, it could be brought into, into play. Uh, so the last couple of points I want to make is um, about whether we're focusing too much in the criminal law on cognitive criteria, criteria of what beliefs you have about the risk, about the certainty of uh, a result occurring, uh, 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 about what you should have believed. Uh, and the law has moved very much in that direction, certainly under the model penal code, and I think to a significant extent in common law jurisdictions, both here and in the United States. Uh, what alternatives could there be? Well, culpable indifference is a somewhat vague idea, but perhaps it can be made more uh, concrete and predictable. Uh, so one possibility uh, would be, in, in, in light of some of the examples we've talked about, Ask the jury, considering the reasons why the defendant was not aware of the risk, was that defendant as blameworthy as an actor who was aware of the risk and who then proceeded to act despite the risk? So maybe use the cognitive test as an anchor and then ask whether a, a person uh, who wasn't aware of the risk seems about as culpable given the kinds of reasons they weren't. Is the reason that they voluntarily got extremely drunk is the reason that they are overconfident in their abilities and so forth. Uh, I, I think a good example of this is a, an actor who gives no thought at all to whether the victim consents to sexual intercourse because he does not care. This person is not advertent to the risk. This is person is not aware of the risk, at least in the narrow sense of on that present occasion, paying attention to and deciding to ignore the fact that the victim uh, is not or probably is not or possibly is not consenting. And yet uh, being the kind of person who gives no thought to whether the victim consents uh, seems to be a, a heightened form of culpability at, as bad in many cases as being aware of the risk and disregarding it. Willful blindness has a somewhat similar structure. Uh, being aware of a risk uh, and choosing not to inquire further so that you don't acquire knowledge seems about as bad as actually having knowledge. Um, and uh, I guess for reasons of time, maybe I'll skip over this, uh, this uh, uh, another issue about gross negligence that might be as culpable as recklessness. Let me just turn to the last slide here, um, which, uh, and, and just a, a personal wor wor word about my own uh, uh, journey uh, in terms of how I view mental states and uh, my own views about the cognitive criteria. About 30 years ago, I wrote an article that was extremely critical of the cognitive approach. And I said, we should use things like uh, culpable indifference, willful blindness much more readily than we currently do and treat them as being as culpable as many cases of cognitive awareness or belief. Uh, and then 
as I started researching this further, and I recently wrote a piece about willful blindness, blindness after uh, looking at an awful lot of cases in the United States about how courts interpret willful blindness. And I find that uh, for the most part, courts were just saying, if you're very careless in not paying attention to the circumstances, we'll say that you're knowing. Well, that's an extru that's quite a leap. It's, it's one thing to say if you're reckless, aware of a risk, and you would have acquired uh, practical certainty uh, or a very high level of, of, of uh, understanding of the risk that you should be treated as uh, knowing. But to convert negligence into knowledge on this ground, I, I think, was, is going too far. Maybe there's a way of re reframing this and redoing this so that it, it's more effective, but certainly the way it's being done in the United States make, makes me very skeptical of whether willful blindness can be done effectively. But then on the third hand, we get to the, uh, the, the, the final stage, or maybe it's probably not the final stage of my evolution. Yeah. I hope it will continue to evolve. But uh, maybe some mixture of cognitive and non-cognitive criteria makes sense. Maybe because cognitive criteria generally are easier to prove and is somewhat more determinative, somewhat more determinate concept, use those, but also sometimes ask the jury, is this person as culpable as a person who was actually knowing or as culpable per, as a person who was actually aware of the risk? So with that, so let me stop. So when I struggle to understand things, I usually try and think in terms of paradigm shifts because it sounds like I've understood it and I haven't really. Um, but I do detect a paradigm shift in, in what you're saying, Ken, and I, and I want just to try and work out uh, for a few minutes whether in the context of English law, it's to use your expression, factual, factually and normatively workable. In other words, uh, can you find lines uh, where it will work? So we we obviously do use a whole host of words to deal with state of mind, and none of them is ad adequate to the task. And what I detected in your paper is a, a, a suggestion that we might try and find a more holistic approach. Um, uh, and you use in the paper a word which you haven't used <laughs> I think you've done it deliberately because I told you I was going to refer to it. <laughs> but it's on the screen, conative. I, I'm tempted to do a poll as anyone who's ever used the word conative. <laughs> I certainly haven't. I had looked it up, but I had no memory of what it meant. <laughs> um, so I did the first thing I do. I did a, a word search on my electronic version of Smith, Hogan and Ormrod, and I was gratified to discover it's not there at all. <laughs> so my inadequacy waned just a little. <laughs> I then did what I often do, which is I go to Auntie Google, and I discovered that there was a paper, it's actually a scientific paper, that talks about where conative fix it, fits into the, the whole scheme of psychological mindsets. And there's cognitive, C, affective, so the emotional, A, and conative, C. I don't think the acronym's going to catch on, no. but... Um, it, it, it seemed to me that uh, there was something in the word conative when I worked out roughly what it means. And I think it's very ill-defined as I understand it, exactly what it means. Um, uh, but I found a definition in this scientific paper. Um, it's been described in several ways, including the mental procedure directed towards action, including volition and drive, or as the connection between cognition and affect to action. And I tried to understand that. And I think what it boils down to is it's the part that affects what's going on, that is the, the drive, the, the movement to affect your cognitive and your emotional, um, the aspects of your, of your mind. And that did feel, does feel to me, like a bit of a paradigm shift because I've always struggled with how in English law we treat recklessness. Um, if someone is seeking to steal from a gas meter, one of our seminal cases, obviously, are they really subjectively thinking about the risk that the leaking gas might endanger the life of someone else? 
or are they really just thinking about their greed, their desire for the money and so on? And many cases struggled obviously with that um, uh, requirement of subjective awareness and we introduced more objective uh, uh, tests until Lord Bingham, the late great, brought it back in, in G. And then he said, but even he, it seemed to me, in bringing back subjective awareness, doesn't really grapple with the problem. Because he said this, it's not to be supposed that the tribunal of fact will accept that a defendant's assertion that he never thought of a certain risk when all the circumstances and probabilities and evidence of what he did and said at the time show that he did or must have done. And that, <laughs> that's the key to me. It's not actually truthful. What we're doing is we're saying we can prove you, in fact, had in mind this subjective awareness of the risk by saying you must have done. Whereas the chances are you didn't. So in G, you have an 11 and 12 year old who set fire to some paper. There's a conflagration. Uh, Bingham and the uh, Supreme Court or House of Lords, I forget which it was, uh, say that, you know, 11 and a 12 year old, are they really um, to be held to have been aware of the risk? If it had been a 31 year old and a 32 year old, pretty sure they would have said you were aware of the risk. But the chances are they were feckless, homeless people who set fire to the newspaper, put it under a bin to keep warm and then their minds wandered and they went off and did something else. They actually had no subjective awareness, but we would fix them with it, which is the artificiality of it that I that I take from some of the um, uh, extremely interesting unravelings in your um, uh, 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 paper. So it, it, I, I found myself thinking about that, and then I got very taken with your reference to the Sexual Offences Act and um, uh, Section One in terms of consent, does something which I don't think we've done elsewhere in the criminal law, certainly in England. Um, it, it, it's quite radical. And the way Lord Hughes, uh, Lord Justice Hughes, as he then was, described it in a case called B, borrowing from Professor Ormrod, who used these words, the consent test in the Sexual Offences Act calls for a qualitatively different degree of vigilance on the part of the actor. So if someone is cognitively just focused on his sexual desire and using various bits of his body in a way towards another person's body, it's not just as simple as did you have a subjective awareness they weren't consenting, it's where's the responsibility on you to ask the questions and that becomes a movable more holistic concept so many of the examples you've used if you incorporate that that more um holistic approach one 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 is getting nearer to the reality so if i don't ask myself the questions i'm culpable even if i never actually thought this woman was not consenting because I have a responsibility and the circumstances and the different scenarios create the different um, uh, responsibilities. So I, I, I then ask myself the question, is this practical? Can it be made normative and uh, fa fa factually uh, pra pragmatic? Um, and my own jury's out on that, I don't know, and I'd be very interested to know what you think. But, but lastly, I think there are um, trends in our law anyway you've talked about gross negligence I think you could actually say that, that what's going on in the jury's test for gross in gross negligence is a holistic question is it so bad in the context of a pre-existing duty where you have a responsibility and therefore a duty to vigilance in our fraud act we've got abusive position of trust which again imposes a duty it's not in the context of recklessness, but it's a similar concept, it imposes a duty on you. And if you don't discharge that duty, which is a elastic and non-fixed thing, then um, you're culpable. Again, imposing on you a degree of vigilance. And lastly, 
um, in bribery, which is something I'm thinking about a lot at the moment because that's my current trial. Again, you've got a duty to act impartially or in good faith uh, or in a position of trust. And it's imposing on you a degree of vigilance to think is giving this piece of reward, this advantage to someone, um, crossing the line of culpability in terms of that duty. So I think I, I, I wonder if that's a fair summary, or at least it's not completely unfair <laughs> of the analysis you brought to bear. And I'm, I'm particularly keen on trying to think through how a, a more holistic approach might be pra practical and how we might use it to, to create the lines in the sand which we have to in, in the practice of the criminal law. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Those are very helpful, very thoughtful comments. Um, on this peculiar word, conative, uh, it, it's actually somewhat more common for people who subscribe to this view to talk about it as an attitudinal uh, view or uh, philosophers call it a quality of will view. So, and I I didn't spell it out as well as I uh, could have in, in this uh, outline of the paper, but it includes intentions, motives, desires. It includes indifference, it includes an attitude of not caring one way or the other whether something happens. Um, it doesn't have to be indifference in the literal sense of having no preference whatsoever about whether the harm occurs or not. It could also mean something like insufficient concern. Uh, but it's not necessarily focused on cognitive uh, awareness uh, uh, states of mind. It could also include as a, as a mitigating factor uh, a, uh, a desire to avoid the harm. A person who takes steps to minimize the harm but still runs certain risks is everything else equal, presumably uh, less culpable than someone who doesn't uh, uh, take those kinds of steps. Um, uh, so, so actually, I do agree with what you described as this paper's div division of cognitive, emotional, cognitive. Emotional maybe fits in, into the cognitive or the attitudinal to some extent. But in criminal law, we don't really care what emotions someone is feeling per se. What we really care about is uh, whether in their actual actions they display something about what they're willing to do, uh, what their desires are, what their intentions are. Uh, and there is a risk if we focus too much on simply a free floating attitude, not connected to action, that's punishing for character, but not for what you did and how you did it and what choices you had when you did it. On the Sexual Offenses Act, I, I, I do think it's a really a fascinating uh, uh, approach that the, sec that the, the, that the uh, British Act uh, takes. Uh, and it does seem qualitatively different. It's, I agree, it seems more holistic, but, but it also, as you pointed out, involves stating explicitly that if you have no awareness at the moment, if the defendant has no awareness at the moment of, of whether the person is consenting, uh, that's not a defense, uh, or that's not, that's not a good, that doesn't defeat uh, uh, criminality. They have to affirmatively have a reasonable belief that the person is consenting in order to not be liable. Uh, so, uh, uh, so yes, in some ways that's more holistic. On the question about moving to gross negligence, I'm a little more skeptical there because I worry that that's just too vague a test. Uh, I mean, you, you could imagine all of criminal law uh, jettisoning all typical mens rea categories and simply asking, did the defendant act with a slight deviation from what we'd expect a, a reasonable person to do, the tort notion of ordinary negligence? Were they grossly negligent? Was it a severe uh, deviation? Were they grossly, grossly negligent? Uh, not going to get very far, I think, in terms of certainty and clarity and predictability by going that way. Though I, I do agree with you. I think there are contexts in which a gross negligence standard as part of the overall structure does make sense. But uh, I'm not sure, and you may not have been suggesting this, but I'm not sure you we would want to go entirely in the direction of just uh, comparing the person to a reasonable person. Um, uh, even if it's individuated to some extent, I think that's not going to capture the, all the distinctions that matter uh, to culpability. But thank uh, you for your comments. Wonderful. Let's just take this opportunity to thank the speakers for the really interesting.